All right, I think we got sort of here. Still not showing. Oh, there we go. There we go. Looks like we're good. All right, um, we're going to work on some more torsion today. Basically, just working through some example problems. Um, we are going to add in the idea of angle of twist. So last time we just talked about torsional shear stress in general, um, and we're going to add in this idea that um, not only might you have a failure in a torsional setup where you literally shear the thing, fracture it, whatever, um, but it might be that the failure is a result of just twisting too much. Um, and we're going to, it's similar to the idea of axial deformation, except now instead of pulling something and stretching it out or compressing it, um, we're potentially twisting something and we want to know how far are we twisting it. Um, so let me, let me get our problems that we want to work here. Um, well, first let's talk about angle of twist in general before we get too far into just working problems. Let's get this lined up. Let's see. All right. So, angle of twist is going to deal with, like I said, um, we're applying a torque, um, and it still only works with, uh, for our equation, still only works with uh, circular, either solid or hollow shafts. And we're looking at something like this. Oh, my camera is not on. Let me see if I can at least get that on. Doesn't really matter, but it'd be nice to have it going. There we go. All right. So now we're back. So angle of twist. Um, let's just draw the end view of a circular solid shaft. Um, let's put a torque on this thing. And assuming that this torque is uh, a great enough value, then it will cause this shaft to twist. Um, so if we were to draw some radial line, let's just say this is point A. Um, this distance is rho. Um, we apply the torque and the the shaft from one end of the other to the to the end we're looking at here twist this line this radial line would end up somewhere over here at a prime um, this angle that it moved through that our solid line moved through the dotted line position um, that angle is the angle of twist and it is in radians. You can talk about it in degrees or whatever, but when you calculate it, uh, it's going to calculate a number in radians. Um, let's see. So what we have um, for an equation to calculate this, theta equals t times Here's that C value over uh, uh, where the rho, the radius, is maximum at the outer. Uh, well, rho is a dimension measured from the center outwards towards the surface of the shaft. Um, when you measure all the way to the outer surface, that is called C. Um, so C is just the largest possible value for rho. So it's the outer radius. Um, you can calculate uh, with a smaller value, maybe the inner radius or something like that. Um, but uh, for this equation, like when we were doing the shear stress, you could calculate, you could put some other value than C. Um, but in this case, we want to know the uh, angle of twist at the surface. Um, so TC, that's not the whole equation, over J, J is the polar moment of inertia, again, same as it was before. And it always equals the same thing because we are only going to deal with circular shafts. So pi over 2 times c to the fourth 
minus b to the fourth. b is that inner radius if you have one. If it's a solid shaft, b equals zero. And it is important to remember that B and C are both radius numbers. They're not diameter. You can put a diameter into this equation, um, but then the equation is pi over 32 times the quantity outer diameter to the fourth minus inner diameter to the fourth. Um, the other thing in this equation um, is, oh wait, hold on. I wrote the wrong equation down. <laughs> so, I, this is partly right, but uh, let me actually let me let me grab something real quick here, and uh, we don't need that C in there. <laughs> we um, not right there anyway. Let me let me fix this. Looking at the wrong thing. All right, so I was com uh, combining two different sets of equations, which is not what we needed to do. Let's let's change this. Not C. It C is still a largest value, but that C doesn't go right there. Um, what we need is L. Um, L is the length of uh, the shaft. Now it might be just a section of the shaft. This works the same way as axial deformation where um, you have different sections that each one has to have the same material, the same forces applied to it, in this case same torques, uh, the same shape, in this came, case the same diameters, um, and that that section, however we divide it up in our entire shaft, um, each section has its own length. And so length, L, is the length of the relevant section. So it's the, in our picture here, you can't see it, it's the distance into the screen. Um, so TL over J, and then this is G. So G is the modulus of rigidity. So modulus of elasticity, E, uh, is what we had in the equation for uh, Hooke's law and for um, the axial deformation equation. It's in the denominator of a lot of the beam deflection equations. Um, G is the same idea, except uh, it's talking about torsion. So it's modulus of rigidity, and it get, you get it the same way, where it's, this, the linear, it's the slope of the linear portion of a graph that's uh, showing a torsional stress versus a torsional strain and um, it it's the same type of thing it's a different number in fact let's look up some of the numbers uh, let's see where if we look over here um, actually I don't have one of those open hold on let's get some material properties Here we go. So, um, material properties. We can look in here. So we've got uh, structural steel. This generic steel. It has. Oh, it's off the page. A little further over. It has a modulus of elasticity of a thousand ksi, twenty nine thousand ksi, so twenty nine million psi, and a modulus of rigidity. 11 million psi um, and so it's it works the same way you have to look it up it's a material property it is not the same as the modulus of elasticity so it's not e um, and you you look at it some of these don't have um, a number listed at all for modulus of rigidity these are your brittle materials so wrought iron cast iron um, they are so brittle that uh, they can't really carry much of a torsion load uh, and so they don't even have a modulus of rigidity listed. Um, 
So wood down here at the bottom doesn't have one. So you have typically, actually I think all the time, a smaller number for modulus of rigidity than you do for modulus of elasticity. Um, it's not necessarily like half or anything like that, but it is a smaller number. Um, so we look it up 11 million PSI for structural steel. So this equation, TL, not C, TL over JG is very analogous to our delta equals PL over AE. So remember that was, oh, hold on. There we go. I just wrote this equation down here. Um, so remember this was our equation for axial deformation. And um, these equations are, you know, they're parallel to one another. So the, the P was the axial force. In the angle of twist equation, you have T, so the torque that's applied to the shaft. You have L, which means the exact same thing in both of these equations. You have A in the denominator for the axial deformation. That's just the cross-sectional area. You don't have the cross-sectional area in the angle of twist, but you have J, which is a cross-sectional property. So it's the polar moment of inertia for that cross-section. So it, it does depend on the shape and size of the cross-section. And then you have E, modulus of elasticity for axial deformation. In angle of twist, you have G, modulus of rigidity. So the same thing, but talking about uh, twisting versus stretching. So very simple equation to use. Um, it does work the same way where you apply it to each section of the shaft individually and add them together. Um, why don't we find us a sample problem that we can apply this to? So I've got, um, got web work. I thought I had web work. It looks like I've closed it. Let's open up web work. Um, so homework 18 will have that and optional three will have that. So let's look in here. Um, this one's just talking about, we actually did this. This was the torque diagram. Um, here also to just the torque, there's a shear stress equation, but let's find one that has, we did this one also Maybe the next one will be a good one. All right, so this one has us calculate torsional shear stress and angle of twist for two different parts. Um, so let's work on this one. Also, um, if you're studying for the exam or something like that, um, and you've run out of problems to work, these problems, the optional ones, they're from the book. They just have different numbers assigned to them. So if you go find this problem in the book, you will be able to look at the problems right next to it and uh, solve that. Now, maybe not every one of the optional problems, but the vast majority of the optional problems are from the textbook. Uh, so you can go and find that problem in the textbook and then work the one right above it or right below it to get another problem to work um, if you're trying to find more problems to practice with. All right, let's... Uh, this problem out here see what we're doing so we have a torque of 27,500 inch pounds is supplied to the 2.7 inch diameter factory drive shaft so shown um, by a belt that drives pulley a so there's a belt of some sort going around this pulley and it's turning the pulley uh, and we're assuming it's not slipping or anything like that it's transmitting all the torque um, so that torque is coming in at A, basically. And then a torque of 16,800 is taken off, is the way they worded that, um, by a pulley, by a belt that's attached to pulley B. So maybe let's draw those in green. We don't know what they're connected to. But um, basically A is an input, B and C are outputs. And we have numbers that say the torque in is 27,500 inch pounds. And I gotta find my calculator. Well, where did I put it? I 
don't see a calculator. So we have input 27,500 inch pounds. Pulley B, the, the one in the middle, um, pulls off, so minus 16,800 inch pounds. Um, so hmm, let's go ahead and make a copy of this so that we can do that and put it over here or down there, whichever. I kind of wanted it up here. Oh, you can't overlap them. Okay. We we'll just move, move it down here. All right. So T out at this location, T out one, we'll say, or T out B is equal to, they gave me uh, 16,800 inch pounds, which left another T out at this one's called C equal to 10,700 inch pounds. So the two output torques add up to the input torque. We're assuming that there's no losses or anything like that, um, which is not true. There really would be some losses, but um, we don't have any information about what those losses are or friction coefficients or anything. So we're assuming it's lossless. All right. Um, Shafts AB, so on the right hand side, and BC, the left hand side, are 5.7 and 2.4 foot long, respectively. So that's telling me that this dimension, 5.7 feet, and this dimension, 2.4 feet. Okay. Um, both shafts are made of cold rolled bronze. Very odd material for shaft, but uh, that's what it says. So we'll look up those material properties when we need to. Determine the maximum shearing stress in each of the shafts. Oh, they also told us that the shaft diameter. Um, well, let's do it this way. 2.7 inches OD. They don't say anything about an ID, so that means it's a solid shaft. Um, and it says the whole, all the shaft is that dimension. All right. Determine the maximum shearing stress in each shaft. So that's here and here. And then the angle of twist of pulley B with respect to pulley A. When you do angle of twist, um, you have to give a reference point. So uh, you want the angle of twist at this point referencing some other point. So in this case, they say at B with respect to A. And then they say the angle of twist of pulley C with respect to pulley A also. So that's actually adding whatever went on from B to C to whatever's going on A to B. So we'll do all that. Um, let's do the torsional shear stress part first. So um, let's do shaft A, B. What order did they put them in? Yeah, they did A, B first. So let's do A, B first also. So we will come in here. Draw our free body diagram to look inside AB. So that'll give us um, something like, just do it all in a row. Here's our input pulley. Well, I'm gonna draw the bearings. All these little bearings um, are just shown there to kind of give you an idea that the, the shaft isn't free to flop around or bend too much. There is something supporting it. As far as our problem analysis goes, they don't exist. They're just there to hold things in space. So we have an input torque. Um, we'll put the input torque as a downward arrow. Uh, 27,500 inch pounds. So this piece, the free body diagram, has to be in equilibrium. Even though it's spinning, um, the, the torque has to be in equilibrium so that uh, it has, it, it's delivering this torque somewhere. And in this case, it's delivering this torque to the two pulleys at B and C. And it has to deliver the entire 27,500 inch pounds. All right. So the torsional shear stress in section AB equals T. Here's where the C actually goes. TC over J. 
Um, and the torque, the internal torque is 27,000. Oops, 27,000. 500 inch pounds times C, the outer radius of this shaft, which they are all 2.7 inch outer diameters. So 2.7 inch divided by two to get the radius. Those units are all gonna work fine. Over J, um, we do have the outer diameter. So why don't we use the pi over 32 times outer diameter to the fourth. So 2.7 inches to the fourth. There's no minus anything because it's a solid shaft. So if, it, if anything, it would be minus zero. B would be zero. Um, so let's see what this calculates as. 2.7 to the fourth power times pi divided by 32. That's our denominator, 5.2. Uh, 27,500 times 2.7 divided by two divided by our denominator is 7,115 Point six PSI. Um, this problem isn't asking for any kind of factor of safety, but let's go see what we're dealing with. It said this is cold rolled bronze. Let's, um, we're in, these were all US units, so let's find, there it is, bronze cold rolled. So it's actually a pretty strong material. Uh, 75 KSI is the Tensile, yielding tensile strength there is no shear strength listed so we would divide our 75 by 2 remember there are different models you can use to figure out the shear strength we're using a very simple model and a very conservative model to just divide by 2 divide the tensile by 2 so 37,500 PSI we generated 7,000 PSI so if I divide 37 Divided by 7115.6. Oh, wait, wait, not uh, not that. Um, if I do 37.5, then this needs to be divided by 7.1156. So we have a factor of safety of 5.3. So we're plenty plenty good there. Um, well, let's actually plug this number into web work and make sure it likes that number as well. So it wants it in PSI 7115.6. And it did like that. Good. All right. Um, the next thing it asks for is the torsional shear stress in the section BC. So for that one, we'll go in here and we'll cut our free body diagram in the middle of section BC. Again, ignoring the um, bearings that are just there with the little X's. We're ignoring those. Um, I put the X's on them because a lot of times when you're just drawing a schematic, uh, you represent a bearing as a rectangle with an X in it. So, and I also put them there to say that they don't mean anything in the context of this problem. All right, um, so let's draw that free body diagram. Um, we could draw the left hand side or the right hand side out of out of habit, I guess. I'm going to show them to draw the left hand side because that's where I started the first problem at um, we would go over to here draw the pulley at um, B draw the little piece of the shaft and show where it's cut we would put our input torque 27,500 inch pounds we would deliver 16,800 inch pounds here which leaves us in the shaft 10,700 inch pounds. So the internal torque in section BC is, you know, not even half what it was in AB. The shaft is the same diameter, so we should expect a much smaller shear stress, torsional shear stress in this section. So tau um, BC is TC over J where torque is 10,700 inch pounds. Same diameter shaft though, so 2.7 over two. That's a two. Same shaft, so the same um, polar moment of inertia. It is possible to have 
uh, different shaft segments all strung together where some they're different sizes and you would have a different J value or maybe they're one's hollow one's not and so you'd have a different J value um, so it is not guaranteed that the denominator is going to stay the same in when you're calculating these things um, so let's see what this is 2.7 to the fourth times pi over 32 10,700 times 2.7 divided by 2 divided by our denominator 2768.6 psi and like i said it's it's you know half of what was in section ab um and i assume that's right let's see 2768 oops 2768.6 yeah that's right okay um, now what it's asking us for is the angle of twist in these different sections. So let's, um, let's just go off to the side here and do theta AB. So this will be the, is that even what it's asking? Yes. Theta AB means the angle of twist at A with respect to B. I put a little slash in mine, but that's fine. Um, so... T L over J G. T is the same internal torque as it was in the shear stress equation. So 27,500 inch pounds. L is the length of section AB, only AB. So that's 5.7 feet. 5.7 feet. We got to convert that, or I'm going to convert that over to. Uh, inches there we go so 12 inches per foot j is the same as it's always been for us and then g we have to look that up cold rolled bronze it was cold rolled bronze right yeah cold rolled bronze Cold rolled bronze, the G value is pretty low, 5.6 million PSI. It's 5.6. And that'll give us our angle of twist. It'll give us in radians, so we do have to, let's see, our web work wants it in degrees, so we will need to convert it over to degrees. All right, 5.6 million times pi divided by 32 times 2.7 to the fourth. We have a new denominator now. 27,500 inch pounds times 5.7 feet converted to inches divided by our denominator, and I get theta AB is 0 0.06438 radians. So to convert that to degrees, multiply by 180 degrees over pi to get rid of the radians. So times 180 divided by pi, 3.69 degrees. All right, let's see if that is web work approved. No. Oh, wait, they have a quite a bit different. Um, let's see if I... Oh, I might have... Let me make sure I got the 5.6 number right and I didn't look at the wrong chart. Um, cold rolled... Oh, I might have looked at the... Oh, I did. I looked at the red brass. Cold rolled bronze. Let's make this smaller so I don't have to scroll across. There we go. Cold rolled bronze is actually 6.5, not 5.6. So these numbers are backwards. So let's, they weren't terribly far off, but they are off. So let's recalculate that. Twenty-seven thousand five hundred 
times 5.7 times 12 divided by our denominator. So 0, 5, 5, 5 times 180 over pi, 3.18 degrees. I'm rounding a little bit. Web work doesn't like that, but 3.18, maybe it'll, maybe it'll be okay with it. It was okay. All right. Um, now this next one's a little bit different. So the next one is asking for the angle of twist from A to C. So that's actually the angle of twist in AB plus the angle of twist in BC. We can't just like lump it all together um, and put a length of uh, 5.7 plus 2.4. We do each set, each section separately and then add the individual sections together. Um, we, we also need to make sure that the internal torques are in the same direction. If they're not in the same direction, then when we add them together, one has to go one direction and the other one has to be negative. So we have to assign a positive and negative. Um, in this case, the internal torques are both pointing upwards, whichever way you want to assign that. Um, they're both in the same direction, which means we can just add them together. Um, that won't always be the case. All right, so what I need to do is calculate the angle of twist from B to C and then add it to A to B. So the torque is the 10,700 inch pounds. The length is 2.4 feet. So it's only the length of that section, not the length of the whole shaft, even though we're trying to calculate the angle of twist of the whole shaft. So it's just the 2.4 feet. Going to convert that over to inches. Our denominator is the same as it was before. So same size. Oops, that's two. Wow, well, if we could do a better two than that. 2.7 inches to the fourth. Same material. Let's get the right material this time. And that's what we would have. So 6.5 million, I think I got all the zeros in there, 2.7 to the fourth times pi divided by 32, um, 10,700 times 2.4 times 12 divided by our denominator, um, really small number this time, but that's to be expected. I have a shorter section and a smaller internal torque. So both of those are in the numerator, which would give us a smaller overall number. The denominator stayed the same. So 0 0.009087 radians times 180 degrees over pi will give us our degrees. Zero point five two one degrees. Uh, now these two both are in the positive direction or both in the same direction. Doesn't matter if it's positive or negative, they're both in the same direction. So angle of twist from A to C is equal to the angle of twist from A to B plus the angle of twist from B to C. So we have to divide it into the little sections. Um, so we had 3.18 degrees plus 0 0.521 degrees is 3.7 degrees. So let's see if web work. Looks like it probably will like that number. Let's put it in. All right, we got it all right. Um, so that's that. This level problem is. What I would consider, so parts of it are really simple, like the one step, like just the this, this part or this part is the really simple problem. Um, this 3.18 is also a simple problem. The 3.7 is at least a medium problem because you do have to realize that you have two sections. You have to add, do each one individually, add them together, figure out if you need to add or subtract them. Um, and so it's got more going on to it. So. Parts one, two, and three here are like the low level problems on an exam. 
um, and the last part would be a medium level. Neither one are going to be a hard version of this problem. In fact, it's kind of hard to make uh, difficult angle of twist problems because there's not a whole lot. You can you can make them more to calculate, like they can have hollow sizes and stuff like that. But the concept is really straightforward. Um, let's see about another one. If we can find something. All right, so here's something. Um, a different material, annealed invar. It does a hollow section that's connected to a brass section. Um, so we have an outer and inner diameter for the hollow section, outer diameter for the solid section. We have some torques. Um, we want to calculate shear stress and angle of twist. This one doesn't offer us a whole bunch of new stuff um, other than it's got a tallow. Let's see if there's a better problem. We can do this one if there's not a better one, though. Oh, actually, let's do this one because it has some design built into it. It doesn't have a hollow shaft. The only difference the hollow does is it um, makes it where you have to do minus B to the fourth in the polar moment of inertia. Everything else is the same. But this one has a design component, so... It will offer us a different way to look at this problem. All right. So what we've got here is we've got a little DC. Well, I don't know. We have an electric motor, AC or DC. I don't, uh, maybe it's an AC motor because it's a big motor. 5.2 kilonewton meters of torque coming out of this motor. So that's quite a bit. So 5,200 newton meter is the torque input. constant diameter cold rolled bronze so this shaft here is all well maybe not that little piece of it we're not really talking about that piece so this piece is cold rolled bronze constant diameter so it's all the same size um, three machines are driven by B C and D so there are these look like they have like sprocket teeth on them so or maybe it's gear teeth I don't know but there's something that is connected to here that goes off that we don't see. You know, there's a chain, something on these three things that are powering these other machines. So we've got 5,200 newton meters of input torque. And then we've got, let's just call them TB as an output at um, two, let's see, yeah, two point or 2,200 newton meters. TC at uh, 1300 newton meters and TD at 1700 newton meters and if I were to add these numbers together they should add to 5200 let's check 2200 plus 1300 plus 1700 is well I'd multiply them that's not what I want 2200 plus 1300 plus 1700 is 5200 so we're, all of our torque is accounted for. Determine the minimum shaft diameter required if the maximum shear stress, stress in the shaft must be limited to 105 megapascals. So in this case, we have a tau allowable is 105 megapascals. Another way this could be given is um, maybe you have a material we do have a material cold rolled bronze um i think yeah cold rolled bronze and we have a um factor of safety and so we have to go look up the tensile strength because the bronze shear strength is not listed so we get the tensile strength divide that by two divide by the factor of safety and that's our allowable shear stress in this problem they just gave us the allowable shear stress um so we want to figure out the minimum diameter if we cannot exceed this as stress. So tau equals T C over J and we know T. Um, so we know that our tau and we're about to know T. Tau we know that 105 times 10 to the 6 pascals is as much shear stress as we can have. The torque we need to figure out where is the torque the highest and um, you can do this different ways uh, 
we we could just look at this one and see that we have 52 uh, 100 newton meters going into the shaft and so everywhere else there's going to be a smaller amount so if i if i cut the shaft right here there's the entire 5200 newton meters in that little section of the shaft the rest of these um, so at this point i have 5200 newton meters at this point i've removed 2200 newton meters so i have um, 3000 newton meters and then if i look in this section i have uh, 1700 newton meters and then if i look at the very end over here i have zero newton meters so the worst case is that section a b um, it had or at least assuming they're all the same material all the same diameter then i'm looking for the place with the highest torque load which is section a b <clears throat> So, the torque in section AB is 5,200 newton meters. I don't know the diameter. That's what I'm, I'm trying to figure that out. So, C is a variable. But I want to know the diameter. So, I might go in and put D over 2 as my variable instead of C. Since I'm trying to solve for the diameter, I want it in my equation. Um, so we do it that way. Um, over J, it's a solid shaft, and I want to know about diameters. So pi over 32 times the outer diameter to the fourth. Um, so now I've got outer diameter in there a couple of times and a bunch of constants. So let's evaluate and solve for the outer diameter. So let's simplify this thing. Let's see. We've got um, 105 million pascals. Um, let's multiply by pi over 32. So that moves that over. So now I've got this number, you know, whatever this number is, um, times OD to the fourth equals 5200 OD over two. Let's divide by 5200, so divide by 5200. Um, let's divide by one over two, so that's gonna be multiplied by two. And now I've got this, 3,964.75 OD to the fourth equals OD. So that's useful, sort of. Let's cancel out one of these with this. 3964.75 OD cubed equals one. Um, so let's take OD cubed equals one over this number and solve for outer diameter. And I get, um, zero point my, my units in here i had meters for the length unit and there's meters inside the pascals also so i'm going to calculate the answer in meters 0 0.0632 meters probably more realistic to talk about millimeters so times a thousand 63.18 millimeters let's see where work agrees um, I came up with 63.182 and it does agree very well all right um, so that's how we can use this to actually calculate a diameter um, given some sort of either material property um, and factor of safety you know a material and a factor of safety or just given the allowable shear stress to begin with so this problem took it a little bit simpler and just gave you the allowable shear stress. If this were a little bit harder problem, instead of giving you this 105 number, they would say um, it, cold rolled bronze shaft, um, you wanna have a factor of safety of 2.7 against yielding. And then you'd have to go calculate this number. So look up the uh, yield or the shear strength of 
cold rolled bronze divided by I think I said 2.7 um, I just made that up though and then you would have this number the rest of the problem would work the same it also wants the angle of twist of D so over here relative to a so that's several sections added together and, and the coupling wait relative to a if the gears and the coupling are all at one oh they're just spacing it 1.5 meter interval that's pretty long um, the shaft has oh so in this one they're giving you a shaft diameter so not the one we just calculated I guess they want the two parts to be independent so if you get the diameter wrong you can still do this other part so if it has this diameter and it's cold rolled bronze what's the angle of twist from D to A all right so that's several little things we do at once let's let's work on those kind of right here so theta D to C is torque in that section which is 1700 Newton meters times the length of that section which they said all of them are spaced at 1.5 meters um, over TL over J pi over 32 they gave us a diameter of um, 73 millimeters I'm gonna put that in meters so 0.0735 meters to the fourth um, times G we haven't looked that up yet um, I guess it's the one we just did though the 6.5 cold rolled bronze so cold rolled bronze 6.5 million PSI so this will give us the angle of twist from gear D to C all of these will be the same direction they'll all have the same uh, they'll all add together or all subtract one another whichever way we want to do it I'm gonna make them all add together um, it doesn't specify anything about uh, trying to figure out if the shaft is rotating clockwise or counterclockwise so we don't need to try and sort that out we just need to know if each one of these is making it uh, twist the same direction and they are if you're not sure of that then you do need to actually go and draw each free body diagram and look at the internal torque we just kind of you know did it up here so we're taking a little bit of a shortcut from what we normally do um, we need to calculate this number though so I got our denominator at 18.6 1700 times 1 1.5 divided by that denominator um, hmm let me make sure I oh <laughs> yeah this is the problem <laughs> yeah oh and somebody posted that in the chat this is the right number but the wrong unit so MathCAD would be okay with that um actually MathCAD would solve it um, web work probably wouldn't be okay with that because these numbers in this chart aren't exactly converted the same in this chart so there's some rounding that happens so you can't really do it that way um, but yeah somebody posted uh, G needs to be an SI right yes you are most correct cold rolled bronze 45 and the units on this are gigapascals so it's 45 times 10 to the ninth Pascals um, I saw that in the chat and then when I punched the number in I got like hundred and thirty six radians which would be ridiculous uh, for this length of shaft uh, so I knew something was off 49 million billion 49 billion times our diameter to the fourth times pi divided by 32 now we have a much larger denominator um, 129,000 1700 times 1 1.5 divided by that denominator this looks more real 0 0.019 bunch of sevens radians I want to leave them all in radians and we'll convert to degrees at the end it wants the final answer in degrees over here all right so that's just this first section 
So let's do section C to B now. This one has 3,000 Newton meters of internal torque. It is also 1.5 meters. That comes from our problem statement right here. Um, the coupling, everything's spaced 1.5 meters apart. So that's where that comes from. And the denominator is the exact same. I should have stored that value. I didn't. Actually, it might still be in here somewhere. Nope. All right. Um, 45 billion times our denominator to the fourth. Oh, not our denominator, our diameter to the fourth times pi over 32. 3,000 times 1.5 divided by our denominator. I get a little bit more because everything's the same except I have more torque, so I should have more twisting. And then... The last section we want to do is the angle of twist from B to A. It has even more torque. You could, in this case, also solve this by ratios. You know, if you know the, if you know the 1700 one, then you can just multiply all these other, multiply that 0198 radians times the, how much greater the 17, or the 3,000 is versus the 1,700 Newtons. So basically you could take um, 0198, 0198 radians for 1,700, multiply that by 3,000 over 1,700 and get the 0349. We could do this one by taking the um, 0349, multiplying by the ratio of 5,200 over 3,000. And we would get this one is 0 0.0606. We'll go ahead and write it out, though. And I will plug it into my calculator just to make sure. Actually, I got a slightly different number when I uh, plugged in. I got 0605. Maybe I don't. I don't remember if where I might have looked at it wrong. Make sure I don't type anything in here wrong. Oh yeah, I because this number is not the actual number. Um, I rounded it. All right, so. You would, you would get similar, particularly if you didn't round, you would get the same number. Um, so, theta from D all the way to A would equal all of these added together. Again, some of these could be going in the opposite direction. In this case, they're not. So you don't have to try and figure out which ones are positive and which ones are negative. They just are all the same direction. Um, so that would be 0198 plus O three, whoops, three, four, nine. Oh wait, O three, four, nine. Wow, can't get the zero in there. Plus point O six O five. Zero point one one five two, that's radians, times 180 degrees over pi to cause the problems asking for degrees. 6.6 degrees. Let's see, web work likes that number. Yeah, they have 6.599, which is the same. All right, so this one um, has two different parts to it. I would say it, for an exam level type thing, this design problem, um, particularly if I just didn't give you this outright, if I made you go find the allowable stress, this one is getting about as hard as these problems can get. So I don't know if I would call that like one of the uh, one of the two or three really hard problems on the test, but it's it's as close as you can get 
other than making this a hollow shaft. And all that does is complicate the actual punching it into the calculator. Doesn't actually make the problem any harder. Um, this part over here with the angle of twist, again, not hard. There's just lots of room, to, you know, you're, you've got eight or uh, 12 numbers that you have to all get right. Well, I guess there's a pi over 32. I was counting just that, the J is one number. Um, so there's a lot of numbers in calculating, you know, punching in the calculator that you have to get right, but that it's not hard. It's just tedious, I suppose. And so you have to be careful with it. Um, and there's convert over to degrees, which is not difficult at all. Just 180 over pi. Uh, multiply radians by 180 over pi to convert that. Um, so I would not think of this as a particularly difficult problem. Although part A, if I told you factor safety and material property or material, then it would be at the harder side of things for uh, exam three. Um, let's just see if there's any other interesting ones to maybe look at. Um, so this is not we are we're not at this yet. We're gonna this is um, power transmission So we're not gonna do any more of those. We'll do power transmission on Wednesday um, So I think we're probably done with these are there any I'll, I'll leave the chat going for a little bit. Are there any particular problems? Maybe even going back to stuff that's uh, older that we want to work or look at um, We have plenty of time what if we added all the torques and just solved? Um, so what if we add the 5,200 Newton meters? In this case, would that work? Well, does it work? No. Um, if you did 5,200 plus 3,000 plus 1,700 over a four and a half meter shaft, in this case, I think that actually might work. Let me... I, don't, I think that might work um, it in this case because all the links are the same all the cross sections are the same it's all the same material that may work in this case if not if you did 5200 but if you did 5200 plus 3000 plus 1700 they're all going in the same direction they all add together they're all the same material all the intervals are the same length so in this case that might work um, I'd have to add it up I assume that's basically what you're doing here um, and so it would work, but not in every case. Um, so you would have to have situations where the links, the intervals were the same. So this 3000 Newton meters was over the same length as some of these others. Um, and, and even that one, you, you could still get, yeah, yeah, that could still work because the denominator is the same. As long as the denominator is same, I think you can add them together if you're certain they're all twisting the same direction. Um, like this problem could be set up where um, you got the torque, the input torque, and then this guy is actually also input. So maybe for some reason this is an input too. Um, and so it's adding more torque to your system. So maybe in something like that, it's gonna get confusing. But in this particular problem, the way it's set up, um, yeah, I think you could just add them, add the torques and the links together. You couldn't just have 1.5 in the numerator. You'd have to have the whole length of the shaft in there. I think that actually would work. Um, I'd have to, you know, it looks like it would work. All right. Any, any other questions or anything that uh, problem you want to look at from previous stuff? The, tour, the, the content for the third exam, I'll, we'll talk about a few things while you might be thinking of stuff to do. Um, the content of the third exam is generally um, more straightforward. So the torsion, the pressure vessels, which we haven't done yet, they're all really straightforward things. There's not a lot of caveats or you know complicated things to deal with. <clears throat> On test three, beam deflection is going to be the hardest uh, content. Um, and mainly just because it uh, it can be the hardest pro content. It depends on the problem I pick for sure. Um, and if I use case five, case five is the one that really kind of throws you because sometimes you have to mirror it and that changes some of the equation. Um, but that's the one with the eccentric point load in a simply supported beam is what that one is. 
Um, so there will be some deflection problems, not necessarily that mirrored case five type thing set up that you, we've had in homework. Um, it also covers exam one and two content. So in general, exam three is the um, best grades uh, that does also be, uh, be affected by the fact that um, some people have dropped the course and their grades aren't calculated in that average. But in general, exam three is the, the simplest one. Um, I've had some questions about lab two. Um, lab two, the purpose of these two labs, lab one and lab two, is, is not really so much to get the lab report done. Um, you, you need to turn it in and do it, but it's not the lab report itself. The purpose of the lab report is to demonstrate that you got SOLIDWORKS to work. So you, you were able to do the simulation for the axial uh, test for lab one and for lab two that you were able to get the uh, beam deflection, the three point bend simulation to work. So that's the real point. So if you're able to show that you've got those things done, then that's what I'm looking for in the report. I'm not looking so much as far as how the report looks, but did you get SOLIDWORKS to work? The final report for the trust project, um, that one is more like a formal report or it is a formal report. Um, if you haven't already started grouping your team together, you probably need to do that. Remember, you can have three people on a team for that final trust project. Um, even if you're all remote, you can still work together to because it's all simulation. Um, and so look at the requirements. Those are written out. And it's got a pretty lengthy, like two or three page list of requirements that go into that report. Um, and some of them, they don't take long as far as you just need to do your simulation and stuff like that. Some of the simulations can take a while. Um, if you don't set them up as trust simulations like the one I showed last week, um, if you set them up as like contact and uh, you're actually assembling a trust, then that simulation could take a very long time to run. So uh, you just need to be in front of that and not wait until the last minute because uh, you might need your computer to do something else other than sit there and run SOLIDWORKS simulations all day. Um, so if you keep them as the trust simulation that I showed, they run really quickly. But if you build an assembly that looks like a trust, that's going to take a really long time to simulate. Um, all right. I didn't see any new questions pop up, so I'm going to say that uh, we have done enough for today. We'll come back on Wednesday. We'll do the last torsion topic. It's power transmission. Um, and then we'll, uh, Thursday, we'll move on to the last little bit, pressure vessels. Uh, there's a little bit more to talk about with finite element method in general, you know, just kind of some of the nomenclature type stuff. Uh, and then we'll, we'll be finished with the course. We just have to do the exams. Um, there is the makeup exam for one or two, exam one or exam two. The way that works is it is a comparable exam to what you originally took, different problems, different numbers, but the same sequence of problems, same level of problems, just different problem statements and different numbers um, and you can take retake either one one or two or neither you don't have to retake either one um, and the new grade completely replaces the old grade so whatever you made before is gone and the new grade even if it's lower is the new grade because that's your current understanding of the content now I don't know if I've ever had anyone make lower on this retake maybe a point lower but not significant lower um, in general the retake is equivalent to getting one more question right so uh, you, certainly there are people who really improved their grade the first time they took the exam maybe they had a pro like a, uh, they didn't get enough sleep or whatever you know it was a bad test day and they make, scored really lowly on or really low on the uh, exam and then they retake it and do much better but typically you get about six points higher, you get one more question right. So that one on the test that um, you knew how to do, but you wrote the wrong answer for whatever reason, you get that one right, is typically how it works. So um, then and one question is six points, usually, depending on some of them, it can be more than that. Um, but that's typical improvement rates. Hardly anybody does worse. Most people get about six points better. And then there's a couple that will really improve their score. Um, also, don't forget that the challenging problems in web work, challenge one, two, and three, um, those sets count for 
a point each, so there's three points, um, on your final course grade. So not on your homework grade, but on your whole course grade, you can get, if you were to do all of the challenging problems, which is hard to do, but if you did them all, you would have a plus three on your final course average. So it, it's a, you know, that's starting to get close to half a letter grade of improvement just from doing those. Um, I think that's all of the things, common questions that I'm getting this time of year. Um, if you have others, let me know. Uh, if you want to set up a office hour Zoom meeting, let me know. Um, otherwise, we'll be back on Wednesday uh, with some power transmission problems, some more torsion stuff. All right, I'll see you all then.